Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillahi amma ba'd. Fa inna khayr kalam kalam Allah wa khayr huda huda rasulillahi wa sharr al-umur muhdathatuha wa kull muhdathatin bid'atun wa kull bid'atin dalal wa kull dalalatin fil nar. Before we begin, inshallah, as we jump these first three minutes or two minutes, I would like to just take this opportunity out to remind you, brothers, of three issues, inshallah, very quickly, very quick. The first one is you were to ask the average Muslim about the wajib prayers in you know, Islam. Most people want to say they are the five prayers that we do during the course of the day, and no doubt. They are the most wajib from the wajib prayers, but also Salat al-Juma uh, is wajib and Salat al-Eid is wajib as well. So we have more than five prayers that are wajib. Another prayer that is wajib that many people don't know is wajib is the two rakats that you have to pray when you come into the masjid. No matter how big it is, no matter how small it is, if you know the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the Masjid He said if any of you Muslims, if you are Muslim, he said if you enter into a Masjid then do not sit down until you pray two rakats. So when you come into a Masjid, even if it's after Salat al-Asr, even if it's after the sun goes up or the sun is going up or it's going down, if you come in at a time where the prayer shouldn't be done, like when the sun is going up or the sun is setting, then don't pray while that's happening. Just stay standing up. Once it goes up, then you pray to rakats. Once it goes down, then you pray to rakats. So I'm mentioning that, khwani, so that I, inshallah, can get the reward of spreading the sunnah and reminding some people who may have forgot or informing some people who didn't know one of the wajib prayers in Al Islam is when you come inside of any masjid, you should pray two rakats. If you came into the masjid and you know that, when you sit down, you are actually, and you know about that, you are going against what the Prophet came with in terms of instruction. So, again, I want to remind this community again. <laughs> if any of you go into a masjid, enter into a masjid, then don't sit down until you pray to Rakat. One time the Prophet was given the khutbah on Friday, and a man by the name of Sulaik, a companion, his name is Sulaik, he came in while the Prophet was given the khutbah on Friday, and the man sat down. Rasulullah said, Hey Sulaik, did you pray to Rakat? And that's a proof that Rasulullah is not Hazar Nazir. It's a proof that he doesn't know the ilm al -ghayb. He was actually there. He was there. He said, Sulaik, did you pray to Raqqa? Sulaik said, no. He said, Qum musalliha, what the joke was fiha. Then get up right now and pray them right now and make them short. So Sulaik got up in front of all the people and he prayed those to Raqqa. So if you're a person who you didn't know this ruling, for an example, you didn't know, don't be shy. Don't be shy to get up. I mean, it's on you. But whether it's this masjid or any other masjid, you should pray those to Raqqa. Second thing that I want to mention to you, brothers, in the way again of uh, trying to spread the sunnah and trying to make the people aware of the sunnah, because maybe you didn't know, is that when the Prophet used to pray, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to always put in front of him a sutra something that would prevent other people from walking in front of him while he was praying. And he never, ever, ever prayed, ever, one time, he never prayed, ever, ever, not in his house, not in his masjid, not in the middle of the desert. He never, ever, ever prayed, except he used to always have something in front of him as a sutra. So there's a hadith that he told us, either salla ahaduku, if one of you prays, then let him put something in front of him. He commanded that. 
Other hadith he said, "La yusalli an ahadukum illa ila sutra." None of you should ever pray except that you have a sutra in front of you. And the way he showed us his actions, he never abandoned it. If he was in the middle of the desert and he wanted to pray, he would make his camel sit down, his camel, and he would pray, and his camel would be in front of him. Umar radiallahu anhu, during the time he was a khalifa, you can imagine some of us are really busy with our jobs, our dunyas, we're quite busy. Umar being the khalifa, he was extremely busy, crazy, extremely busy. After praying, he was leaving the masjid. He saw a man praying in the middle of the masjid with no sutra. Umar radiallahu anhu sat in front of that man with his back to the man facing the qibla. After the man finished his prayer, Umar turned to the, towards the man and he said to the man, radiallahu anhu, he said, the Prophet used to command that you pray with the sutra. He used to prohibit you from praying without a sutra. And he himself used to do the sutra. So don't let someone come and say, ah, sutra. The Muslims in Kashmir and Al Iraq. Don't, don't be of those people. Because if we can't take care of what people perceive as being the small things, then how are we going to take care of those big issues? And another thing is, this is something that is within the ability of a person to do. And again, as I mentioned, we're just trying to spread the sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Last thing and the final thing, as I understand, inshallah, this masjid uh, now is starting to kickstart the activities once again in the masjid. And this is something that causes the hearts to become sakina with sakina because we want to bring life back to the masjid, make the masjid what it has been legislated to be. It's first and foremost the place of a sajda. It's the masjid, the place of prayer, salat. But it's also the place of reminding each other of the dhikr salat. It's the place of uh, strengthening our brotherhood. It's the place of leaving that dunya out there and coming to a place where an individual is trying to be focused on remembering what he was created for and so forth and so on. So we ask Allah Azza wa to bless all of the brothers who have something to do with um, this lofty objective of uh, trying to get these classes going again. But I want to remind you brothers, once the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was traveling with his companions and they became tired, he became tired, like every human being becomes tired. And so he decided to stop at a particular place and when he stopped he told his companions everyone take a rest here. So some of the people went over there, some went over there, some went over there, and they all chose different places to rest. When he looked out and he saw the people all over the place, he said to his companions, Mani Arakum Aizin, Inna Tafarukukum Fihadi Shi'ab, Inna Madarika Minish Shaita. He said, Why is it that I see you people all over the place? Some people over there, some over there, some over there. He said, This division of yours is from the Shaita. So the companions, Radiallahu Anhu Ajma'in, they came together. They said after that hadith and after that instruction of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they never came to the masjid or to listen to his kalam, except that they came close to one another. Those scholars who wrote about unity in Islam, unity based upon the Quran and the Sunnah, not unity based upon empty slogans. I mean, someone can really get out of the member and give a really nice talk inspiring talk, very fiery talk about the importance of unity. They can do that. But there are some basic things that the Prophet showed us in his practical sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that bring about unity. And one of them is that when we come together and talk like this, today, inshallah, the subsequent talks that are going to be given in this masjid or any other masjid, then it is not, ikhwan is not, from the sunnah of the Nabi for the people to sit far away. So those brothers who are sitting on the walls, it's just a request, just a request, not to put anyone out. I ask you brothers to come close to your brothers, inshallah, azawajal, if you can do that. And don't think that I'm pointing you out, maybe you didn't know. And in terms of sitting close at Hwari, especially on the day of Friday, the day of Friday, don't be an individual who on the day of Friday, when you come into the masjid, you sit in the last row, you sit on the wall. Don't be like that. Because from the etiquettes of Friday Juma, from the etiquettes of that Friday Juma, if you want to get and you want to maximize the rewards of the Juma, Prophet says also, the one who takes a ghusl, he causes someone else to take a ghusl. He puts on perfume, 
he puts on nice clothes, he comes to the mischief, every right step is a hasan, written, every left step is a bad deed taken off. When he comes into the mischief and he gets close to the imam and he doesn't break the shoulders of two people sitting there, if he did all of those things every week when he came to the mischief on Friday, he's going to get a lot of rewards. A lot of rewards. So before we start our lesson, we just wanted to remind you brothers of those three things, those three things, and all of them go show and improve the importance of us being people who take the time out of our extremely busy schedules to try to get some basic knowledge of our religion. The etiquette of the mischief, the etiquette of the mischief, there are many, many etiquettes of the mischief, many, many do's and not do's and don'ts, what to do, what not to do. A lot of people don't know those etiquettes. The etiquettes of Friday, a lot of do's, a lot of don'ts, the etiquettes of prayer, very first thing Allah is going to question you about Yomul Qiyam is that prayer. So that in of itself shows that it's important. So we only mention those things not to expose anyone or not to put anyone out, but again, just to spread the Sunnah. And I ask Allah to to make us from the Ansar of the Sunnah, Yomul Qiyam, give us the reward of being from the Ansar of the Sunnah. And if we can't be of the people who are saying it, at least the people who are doing it, and also to be of the people who love the Ansar of the Sunnah, starting with the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahib Sunnah himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Before I begin my talk, last thing I have to mention, I just want to acknowledge the presence of my Lala, my main man here, Sheikh Shabab. Shabab can never come into a place except that it lights up, and the first thing that lights up is my heart. And I don't mean Sufi light up, I'm just saying in terms of love, in terms of love. So welcome, Lala Shabab. Khwani, now as you all know, we are getting close to the blessed month of Ramadan and I'm sure that some of you have been exposed to different talks and different um, instructions in preparation for Ramadan. I don't really want to deal with the fifth of Ramadan as such in this talk. Maybe during the Q&A session, we can deal with some ahkam of uh, Ramadan if people have questions. Maybe during that time, no problem. But I want to deal with the Ramadan from another angle, inshallah, just to shed light on something, to really remind you of some issues. And before doing that, I just want to let something be the backdrop, and that is what the Nabi said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the Jannah, the Jannah. And we're all in a path and a struggle of trying to aspire to enter into the Jannah. May Allah put us all in the Jannah to fill those and put us in there without any adhaq, without any hisab, not even asking us any questions because he is qadrun ala dhalika. And may he ta'ala allow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be a intercessor for us yawmul qiyamah so that we're not punished at all. Concerning the Jannah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned inna fil jannati ma la aynu ra'at wa la Inside of the Jannah is what no eyes have ever seen. And inside of the Jannah is what no ears of a human being has ever heard. The eyes or the ears of even the Malakika Allah put in that Jannah, what no eyes have ever seen and what no ears have ever heard. And in that Jannah is what He said, even the human being hasn't even contemplated it. So that goes to show that the Jannah is something that is special, is different, it's on another level. And it's been described in many ayat of the Quran, and many ahadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This Quran that we read, if someone said, can you give me 20 descriptions of a Jannah, what's in the Jannah? There are hundreds of descriptions of the Jannah, different things that have been prepared for the people of the Jannah. So in that Jannah, special things. Allah Ta'ala mentioned from those things a lot, a lot. He said, Tabaraka Ta'ala, wa bashir al-lameena aminu wa aminu al-salihati anna lahum jannatin tajmi min tahti al-anhaar kullama ruziqu minha kullama ruziqa minha min thamaratin rizqa qalu hadha al-ladhi ruziqna min qabl. 
وأوتوا به متشابهة ولهم فيها أزواج مطهرة وهم فيها خالد In that Jannah, you should give glad tidings, Ya Muhammad, and tell those people who believe and do righteous deeds that Allah Azza has prepared for them Jannat, under which rivers flow. Every time they are given something in that Jannah, from the thamar of the Jannah, they say, this is something that we used to have similar to it back in the dunya. And we will give them these things and there are some similarities. And from the similarities inside of that Jannah are the Huru'een. They will have some wives who are pure and they will remain in that Jannah forever. The tafsir of this ayat is expensive. The Huru'een and the things that are in the Jannah that are similar to what was in the dunya, like the khamr, the sharab. But the sharab or the khamr of the Jannah is not like the khamr here when you drink it. You don't get drunk, like the leaven, the leaven, the milk of this dunya, they have milk in the Jannah, but it doesn't go rotten, it doesn't spoil. The water that's in the Jannah and the springs in the Jannah, they have springs here, but the springs are there, different. Those people from this Ummah who have to go into the hellfire, may Allah protect us from that, some of them will be put in the hellfire, and then, and then Rasulullah will get involved, and he'll make one of his six types of intercession. He'll get involved. And he'll ask Allah to get them out. They're in the hellfire. And they deserve to burn more. But he'll get involved. Because they were from the Ansar of the Sunnah. Because they used to make the dua after the Adhan. He said, anyone who makes the dua after the Adhan, I'll give him my shifa. Because he used to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or whatever commitment he used to do, whatever. Then Nabi will get involved. And Allah Ta'ala will take them out of that hellfire. after they will burn to a crisp for what they did. And for what they didn't do. And then they will be put in one of the springs of the Jannah and then they're going to sprout and they're going to come back to life in a way that was better than what they used to be. So that particular spring of the Jannah, that spring of the Jannah, it's not like the springs that people go to get in, like in Jordan and other than that, where they call it the spring of life, where it may have some medicinal value, but it's not like that spring. So there are some similarities, but they're not the same. From what Allah Ta'ala mentioned about that Jannah, and this is just the backdrop of what we want to talk about, inshallah. He said, لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سر مرفوعة وأكواب مرفوعة He said, in that Jannah, they are not going to be any vain speech. And that Jannah is going to be rivers that are going to be constantly moving, going back and forth all over that place. In that Jannah, they're going to have chairs and couches in which they're going to be reclining on and they're high and they're elevated, making it easy that the person, when he wants to sit down, there will be no efforts to sit down. If he wants to eat, whatever he wants, everything is real easy for him. He doesn't have to move too much. So in those ayat from Surah Al-A'la, some of what Allah Azza mentioned, in al-abrara yashrabunim min katsin kana nizajuha kafura. He said that the abrar, the people have a bin, the righteous people, they would drink from a vessel in a jannah called kafur. It has kafur. A lot of ikhtilaf, what is that kafur? Point is not what it is exactly, but it's there. He said they will get vessels to drink from that kafur, and everyone would have his decree. He's going to have a million vessels to drink from that. He's going to have whatever. So there are many, many issues. Many issues. One of the things that we want to talk about concerning the Jannah Ikhwani is something that's been prepared in the Jannah specifically for people who fast in the month of Ramadan. Certain things that are done in the month of Ramadan that put a person in position to get the reward of some of the tremendous issues that are in the Jannah. That's what I want to come to remind you of. To keep this in your mind. And they are simple, basic issues. And I want to write down, Khwari, as the ayah said, Everyone here, he has his particular thing that he's good at. That brother over here, he's in the first row for all of the prayers. And he's on the right side of the imam, even for the khutbah to Jummah. And that one over there, he may hajj six, seven, eight times, and umrah six, seven, eight times. 
And that one over there, he has good and bitter wadi dain. He's better than everyone else. And that one over there, he's the best parent, the best husband. He's committed, dedicated to his children, better than everyone else, or to his wife. He's the best one to his wife. And that one over there, he gives a lot of sadaq. And then there are those people who are the fastest from amongst our community. They just don't wait until the month of Ramadan, but they fast and they find fasting easy and they like fasting. So everyone has his own role, as Allah has been mentioned, that I, everyone. The person who fasting is not his main thing, it's not his forte. Still, if you do the basics of Ramadan, the basic etiquette of the Sunnah of Ramadan, you will position yourself to get these special rewards in the Jannah. Special. And they're what the Prophet described, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as some special rooms. In addition to the houses that the people will have in the Jannah, there are some special rooms that people who fast will be given and want to share that with you. One of the ayat of the Quran talks about these rooms. Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ آمِنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُبَوِّيَنَّهُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ غُرُفًا تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِ الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا نِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ Verily those people who believe and they do righteous deeds, we have prepared for them from the Jannah some special rooms. Under these rooms there are rivers flowing. They will be in those rooms forever. And this is a ni'mah reward for the people who do the works. And another ayat talking about those rooms, Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, لَكِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ لَهُمْ غُرُفٌ مَبْنِيَةٌ لَهُمْ غُرُفٌ فَوْقَهَا غُرُفٌ مَبْنِيَةٌ تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِ الْأَنْهَارِ وَعْدُ اللَّهِ لَا يُخْلِفُ اللَّهُ مِعَادٍ Those people who have the taqwa of their Lord, He has prepared for them rooms that are on top of other rooms and those rooms are strong in the way that they have been built on top of each other. Under those rooms, rivers flow. And this is the promise of Allah for those individuals and Allah doesn't break His promise. So, as you can see, those rooms are in addition to the Jannah. Many things have been mentioned about those rooms. The Nabi used to tell his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, many things about their environment so that they can appreciate certain things. He said, Yom Al-Qiyamah, you people want to see your Lord. The same way you see the moon on the full night, the 15th of the month, the better moon. He said, when you see that moon and there are no clouds in the sky, and there's no doubt that that is the clear moon, that's the moon, he said, you're going to see Allah that way, meaning the clarity, the clarity. So he took the environment so as to help them to understand something. He said the virtues of the scholar over the one who worships is like the virtues of a full moon. Many things in their environment. He said the one who gives a gift to someone, he gives a gift to someone, and then he says, give me that gift back, and he takes it back. He's like a dog who licks up his vomit, because he knows that the Arabs know if a dog vomits, he's going to get up, and he's going to lick that vomit up. So you don't have to worry about the carpet or whatever it happened. Just sit there. That dog, his fitra, his nature, is he's going to lick it up clean. That's how he is. So that's the environment that they were in. So when the companions look at that, they say, oh, who wants to be like a dog who licks up his own vomit? So don't give a gift and take it back. Don't give a gift, your wife's dowry or something, and then you take it back. You buy your kids something, and then you take it back. <sighs> Similar to that is these rooms. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said about those rooms that the people when they're in the Jannah, if you were to look in this earth and you looked in the sky and you see the planet or the star twinkling in the distance, he said that's how those rooms are going to be. The person is going to be in the Jannah and he's going to see all of those rooms all over the place and they're going to be illuminating the atmosphere and in and of itself is going to be a reward, just something to behold. Not to mention what's inside of it. Not to mention who's going to be the occupant of the room. So a number of things have been mentioned. Those who believe and they do righteous works, those people who have the taqwa of their Lord, 
It is not like Ahlul Kitab is saying, Khwani, those Jews and those Christians, they are making mere claims. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, then you're going to go to paradise, and you're going to get this, you're going to get that. That's just a mere claim. They're lying. They changed the religion of Isa. They changed the religion of Musa. They introduced innovation in their religion. Allah mentioned from the innovation of the Jews and the Christians, Rahbaniyatan ibtadu'uha ma kitabnaha alihim. They introduced some aestheticism where you live in some monastery and you don't get married. Allah said, that's an innovation. Allah didn't reveal that to them. Allah didn't legislate that for them. But they make many claims. We're going to be in the Jannah. We're going to be in the Jannah. We're going to get this. We're going to get that. Just as Bani Israel made a lot of claims, Al Kitab made a lot of claims, our woman should know we can't make claims. Those rooms are not for the one who's just sitting down talking about, I'm with the best Ummah, I'm a Muslim, that's it. It's not like that. I fast a month of Ramadan and that's it. It's not like that. There are some conditions, things that have to be done in order to get those rooms, as it was mentioned. They have to have Iman, the proper Iman. Not making shit with Allah in any shape, form, or fashion. He excommunicates himself and puts himself out of the box, out of the loop, to get the Jannah if he's making a partner with Allah in any shape, form, or fashion. If he said that the Prophet وسلم, was Hazir, Nazir, Rasulullah وسلم, never died, Rasulullah وسلم, has the ilm al ghayb, if he said that and he believed that, he excommunicates himself and he puts himself out of the ability to get those rooms, to go into Jannah. And Rasulullah is going to free himself from that individual Yom al -Qiyam. He's going to free himself. Instead of making intercession for him to get him out of the hellfire, instead of making intercession for him to prevent him from going into the hellfire, Rasulullah is going to say, I'm free from that individual. I'm free from him. Don't let him drink from my fountain. Get him away. Get him away from my fountain. So it's not mere claims <laughs> for anyone here. And in those examples that I said, Hazrat Nazir, Ilm al Ghayb, he never died. I don't mean to be taking punches at any individual here. I'm just saying in general, it's not just that person. It's Abu Usam, it's everybody here. It is not lip professing that will get those the people the reward of the agenda. I want to be on the Sunnah. I just can't lip profess. When I'm by myself, I have to do the right thing. Everybody, that's our responsibility. So concerning those issues of just mere claims, just want to share with you real quick before dealing, inshallah, as a general, with those issues that we want to encourage you with. Allah mentioned in the Quran, لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيِّ أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ This religion, the hop, is not based upon he said about this ummah, it's not based upon your wishful thinking. What's right is what you wishfully think. What I wish for, it's not what's right or wrong. It's not what you wish, what you think. Nor is it what Anu Kitab, what they say. Another ayah, you describe Anu Kitab. وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّةً وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ From the illiterate people, Allah called them illiterate are those people who don't know the religion. They have nothing but wishful thinking. So we don't want to be of the people who just wish Prophet Muhammad is going to have intercession for me. La. Abu Huraira one time said, Ya Rasulullah, Men as'adu nas bi shafa'at yom al Which one of us will have the most right for you to step forward to make intercession for us yom al Which one of us in this masjid from the companions from right now? Who has the most rights? He said, Abu Huraira. I didn't think anyone would ask me that question before you. That's an intelligent question. And when I saw you being busy with learning the hadith, my hadith, I saw you being prolific and uppermost, learning, especially the sunnah. You're memorizing more, better than anyone else. So I assume, and I'm an intelligent person, sallallahu alayhi wa the natural result of the way you are with the sunnah is that you'll be the first one to ask such an intelligent question. And then he answered. He said, "As'adu nas bi shafa'ati yom al-qiyamati man qala la ilaha illallah khalis min qalbi." The one who has the most right to get my intercession yom al-qiyam is the one who says la ilaha illallah 
with total ikhlas. Total ikhlas. What he does, what he says, what he doesn't do, what he doesn't say, everything about him is not to show off to the people. It is for the tawheed of Allah Azza wa To make Allah please, like it, like it, dislike it, dislikes it. He doesn't want to offend, but his existence is the existence of the muwahid. That's the one who will get the intercession. That's the one who will get the Jannah. The one who has ikhlas towards Tawheed. The one who has knowledge about Tawheed. The one who has a sit and he believes in Tawheed. The individual who makes inqiyad and he works by the Tawheed and so forth. It's just not wishful thinking. That's the point. That's the point. So what are the things? What are the things? Four things we want to mention that come from a hadith connected to Ramadan from an Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa But before that, in an authentic hadith that was collected by Imam Ahmed and his Mustaq as well as an Imam al tirmidhi Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that Rasulullah said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taslimin kathira, inna fil jannati ghurafa, yura zahiruha min batiniha, wa batinuha min zahiriha, a'addaha allahu ta'ala liman, at'ala ta'am, وألان الكلام وتاب الصيام وصلى بالليل والناس نيا. He said, verily in the Jannah there are some rooms that are special. He said these rooms, if you're standing outside of these rooms, you can see the inside of the room from the outside. And if you happen to be on the inside of the room, although it has walls and things like that. Still, you have the ability to see the beauty of what's outside of the room because it's special, it's a special issue. If you're on the outside, you can see in, and if you're on the inside, you can see out. Allah knows the reality of that, but we ask Him by His ism and a'lam to make us the participants and the recipients of those rooms. He said, These rooms have been prepared for people who do four things, all of them connected to Ramadan but not specific to Ramadan. They should be a part of the repertoire of the Muslim, his existence, something he should focus on. He said they have been prepared for the people who feed other people food. They're the people who, when they speak, they're gentle and they're easy when they talk to people. Number three, they're the people who continuously fast. And number four is for the people who, for the people who pray during the nighttime when the other people are sleeping, when the majority of the people are sleeping. Again, we want to repeat that hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Those four things. Allah has prepared their special rooms in the Jannah, those special rooms for four individuals, people who do four things. All of them have been legislated in the month of Ramadan, highlighted in the month of Ramadan. The emphasis on them in the month of Ramadan is greater than outside of Ramadan. And Ramadan, as you all know, is a month of tadri. It's a month of learning things and doing things that should carry you on in terms of good deeds after Ramadan. The people who feed other people. Number two, the people who are gentle and easy in their speech. Number three, the people who fast continuously. And number four, those individuals who, those individuals who pray while the people are sleeping. Each one of these four things, Ikhwani, has a lot of issues that can be discussed concerning them. But we just want to briefly mention, in our religion, Al-Islam, you won't find another group of people, Ummah, community. You won't find a community of people who feed in a has such a prominent place in their society or in their religion, the way Al-Islam puts emphasis on feeding people. In Ramadan and outside of Ramadan, when I lived in this area, and I lived in this area, in Keith, and other than this area, in Arabia, but in this area specifically, everyone here knows, like if you're a revert, if you're a revert in this area, you're going to be exposed to the Muslims. And if you're exposed to the Muslims, Arabs, Africans, Asians, you're going to be the recipient of their hospitality. When I was a Christian, I don't remember, other than my relatives, going to people's homes to have dinner and things like that 
except if it was Christmas or Thanksgiving or Easter, something like that. But if you're a reaver, if you're a Muslim, you're going to be exposed to other people who are inviting you because it's part of what our religion is telling people to do. And when Allah Azzawajal chose Rasulullah from amongst the Arabs, one of the wisdoms in that is that the Arabs had some cultural things that Al-Islam came and said, these are from the best characteristics that people should inculcate within themselves and their culture. And from them, it'amu ta'am, feeding people food. To do it has a lot of reward in the Quran and the Sunnah, and not to do it out of stinginess has some price to pay. That's negative. Too much to be said. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, look at all of the rewards just for feeding people. And just one surah of the Quran, Surah Al Insan, Hal Ata Al Insan, Hainun Min Al Dahi, Lem Yakun Shayn Madkur. In that surah, Allah mentioned, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ بِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا إِنَّا لَخَافُ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْتَرِيرًا فَوَقَاهُمُ اللَّهُ شَرَّ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ وَلَقَاهُمْ نَدْرَةً وَسَرُورًا وَجَزَاهُمْ بِمَا صَبُرُ جَنَّةً وحرير متكئين فيها على الأرائك لا يرون فيها شمسا ولا زمهرير ودانية عليهم ودانية عليهم ذلالها وذللت قطوفها تذليلا All of those rewards Allah described and said those people who feed other people because they feed other people although they themselves they love the food but despite that they feed other people Allah said that they say to the people they feed, we only feed you liwajhillah, because of Allah with ikhlas. We are afraid of our Lord of a day where there's a terror and a grievous punishment. Allah said because of that, Allah has protected them from the evil of that day. Allah will make their faces illuminated and will give them happiness. Allah will reward them on that particular day with Jannah and Harir. The Jannah in this ayat are those rooms. <coughs> As an Imam Ibn Kathir brought all of those a hadith that we mentioned earlier in some of the other ayat. So Allah Azza will put them in that Jannah. They will recline in the Jannah on couches and they will have felicity and ease. And close to them will be, you know, like the grapes, the kutuf, when the grapes come down on the grapes, any fruit, when they come down in their clusters, the person who can eat doesn't have to move. All he has to do is pick it off of the tree. They're going to be shading him and they're going to be low to him. And then Allah Ta'ala went on to mention maybe 15 other descriptions of the individual who is feeding. So in the month of Ramadan, one of the most important aspects of Ramadan at 20 that we want to remind you of is the aspect of being an individual who's responsible for putting some dates in the masjid so that the people can break their fast off of your dates. Especially the people who at some time, some point, they weren't fasting. They were 20, 21, 25. There was a time some Ramadans went past them. They missed it. Rasulullah mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and fattar as-sa'ima kanalahu ajr mithlu sum mithlu ajr as-sa'im min ghayla yanqus ajru shay'a. Anyone who breaks the fast of someone else, Ramadan outside of Ramadan, the individual will get the reward of his fast. It didn't say the one who invited everybody and gave them a big meal. It said the one who broke his fast. So if an individual was the one who was responsible for putting the dates down, putting the water down, he purchased the water. He's the one who's on that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in this masjid, for an example. He's going to spend 500 pounds, whatever it costs, and he's going to have a community iftar. Everybody who broke his fast, they'll get the reward. And that's one of the ways of making toba for the fast that he missed in the past. It's almost impossible to remember how many prayers he didn't make when he wasn't praying. It's impossible. How do you calculate? It may be extremely difficult to calculate how many fasts did he miss in Ramadan and other than Ramadan. Because when he broke one day of Ramadan in the past intentionally, now he has to free a slave. If he can't free a slave, he has to feed 60 people. He has to feed 60 people. He can't do that. He has to fast 60 days consecutively. He can't keep up with that. How many days does he owe for Ramadan? It's difficult. 
one of the things to try to offset that is being an individual who's responsible for feeding other people. Concerning being stingy and not feeding people in the religion is Surat al-Mudathir. Surat al-Mudathir. I want to mention about the discussion that's going to take place with people in the land of Jahannam. And they will be asked a question, Ma sarathakum fi saqr? Why and how did you people wind up in the saqr, in the land of Jahannam? What, what, what got you here? They will say, Lam nakum min al We weren't of the people who used to pray. Wa lam nakum nut'im min al masakin. We didn't, we didn't feed the people. We weren't of those people who feed. And we used to disbelieve in the Yom al -Din. So not feeding is a problem in our religion. So we want to take this opportunity out wanting to remind you something very important. The Brotherhood of Islam. We have some reverts who are not married. And one of the most difficult times to become a Muslim is in the month of Ramadan, especially when the days are long like now. When the days are short, the winter time is easier. But if a person embraces the, this religion in the month of Ramadan and the days are long right now, it can be a trial for him where he starts to say, I don't know if I made the right decision because I didn't know fasting was this difficult. Allah in the beginning of Islam, the Muslims didn't have to fast in Mecca. But when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa traveled to Al Medina, the first year when he got in Al Medina after the Hijrah, 13 years in Mecca, and the 14th year in Islam when he came to Medina, he came to Medina and he saw the Jews fast, he saw the Jews celebrating, not fasting, celebrating, having a party. He said, what are they doing? Why are they celebrating? If he was Hazir Nazir, he wouldn't have asked that question. Every time the Prophet asks the question, it's because he's not Hazir Nazir. If he knew the Ilm al ghaib he wouldn't have asked the question. When he would say, Whose camel is this? The man would say, that's my camel. If he knew the Ilm al ghaib he would have known whose camel that is. So every time you pass by a hadith where he's asking a question, he's asking someone, who are you? Where did you come from? What happened? It's a delil. So how is the person going to insist? The Prophet is going to give me shifa. He's going to insist. I'm going to be from the people of the Jannah because I'm from this Ummah. But the prerequisites of going to the Jannah, the prerequisites of being the Shafa, you don't meet them because you don't have that correct iman and that correct understanding. He sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam did not have the ilm of the unknown, only what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the ability to know. That's it. And the Malakika are the same way. So it's really important, Khwani, that we understand that particular issue. So concerning that, when he went to Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, well, what are they doing? They said, Ya Muhammad, this is the day that we Jews celebrate because Allah saved Musa over Fir'aun. So the Prophet told his companions, Nahnu al-Haqqu bi Musa minhu. We have more right to Musa than them. We're closer to Musa and Isa and the prophets than them. So he said, we're going to fast. They're partying and having a good time. We're going to fast. So he told his companions, fast. So everybody fasted. The fast of Ashura fasted three levels in Islam. The fast of Ashura was wajib. Just you pray, you fast on the tip and that was it. He told them, if I live, if I live, if I live, I'm going to fast more. So that's how they fasted at first. And then after that, some Muslim by fasting was made mustahab. If someone wanted to fast, he could fast. And if he didn't want to fast, he just pays the fidya. He feeds one person who's hungry. That's all he had to do. But he didn't have to fast. It was up to you. If you want to fast, you fast. And if you didn't want to fast, you just feed a poor person. And that's the meaning of the ayah in the Quran. For men to tawa khairun, fahu khairun lahu. Wan to sumu khairun lakum in kuntum ta'lamun. Anyone who wants to give. Wa ala ladini atiku nuhu fidyatun. Anyone who has the ability, then he should feed the poor person. But every day you miss the fast. That was the second one. And then the second year of the hijrah. After the second year, Allah revealed that you had to fast in the month of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan.
So those were the three levels of fasting in Al Islam. And why did Allah do it like that? And this is the point. Allah did it like that, Ikhwani, because Allah is gentle and Allah is easy and He wants good for everybody here. He doesn't want to make things difficult for anyone. He doesn't want to make things difficult for the rich, for the poor, the Arab, the not Arab, the old, the young, Muslim, non Muslim. And the Sunnah of people who are trying to teach this religion, wherever they are, the sooner we understand that, the more effective our da'wah is going to be in this country. Muslim patrol, they don't understand that. People who want to stab policemen and soldiers in the middle of the street, don't understand that. The mother, the father, the father, he has to understand. Allah wants things easy for your kids. The Imam of this masjid, the Imam, the Imam. If he doesn't understand that Allah wants things easy for this community, he's going to make problems. The administration, on the day of Juma, the Imam is going to give the khutbah, and he's going to give the khutbah for three hours. And he expects us to sit there, he wants to pray, and he's going to pray Salatul Juma for with Surah Al Baqarah. No, you have to know in that audience. There's a man praying on the chair in the audience. Someone has to go to work in the audience. There's a lady up there with a child and issues like that. So Allah Ta'ala legislated everything in this religion gradually. The tadaruj. Because if a person is not used to the thing, it's going to be difficult. Aisha said, if Allah made khamr, sharab, haram, one time, one go, the Arabs would have left Islam because it was a part of their culture. Slavery. If the Rasul would have come to those Arabs and abolished slavery just like that because of the way they were doing it, it's a problem, it's bad, it's a good one. If he came and just abolished it just like that, it's going to be problems because part of the economic life was built upon slavery. So in Islam, in the legislation of Islam, change is not made overnight. There's Kadoj. And that's what Allah Ta'ala did with all of the arkan of al-Islam. Tawheed, 13 years, he was in Mecca, he just called to La ilaha illallah. That's it. He told Mu'ad ibn Jabal Mu'ad, you're going to the people from Al-Kitab, make the first thing you call them to La ilaha illallah. If they do that, then tell them they have to pray. If they do that, then tell them they have to give zakat. So when we're giving da'wah, we don't start with the most difficult thing. You don't start to learn the most difficult thing in the religion. You don't go into the most difficult aspects of this religion. So the point, Khwani, the individual who is a brand new Muslim in this religion, if you know him, in the month of Ramadan, we should exhibit the brotherhood of Islam by supporting those individuals and also remembering, unlike you, he doesn't have people we can go home to to break his fast with that same feeling that you have. So I encourage you and I advise you, take those individuals that you know and help those reverse out, especially those people you know are living by themselves, individuals who don't have the ability to have that sweetness of the taste of Ramadan. If you know those individuals, then be of the people who provide for them, especially here in the masjid. Be of those people who get that reward. The second issue is the issue of when people are gentle and easy with their speech. There's a companion, his name was Abdullah ibn Sufyan. May Allah be pleased with him. He asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, ma akhwab shay takhshahu alayya. What is the thing that you fear for me more than anything else? What are you afraid for me more than anything else? He told him, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, akhsha alayk hadha. I'm afraid of this more than anything else concerning you. In the month of Ramadan especially, especially, if the individual is not taking responsibility for what he's saying and the way he's acting, then the Ramadan, it comes and it goes and we really don't get the real benefit of the Ramadan. He told the people, لَيْسَ الصِّيَانِ مِنَ الشُّرْبِ مِنَ الْأَكْلِ وَالشُّرْبِ وَإِنَّمَ الصِّيَانِ مِنَ الْلَغْوِ وَالرَّفِفِ وَإِنْ سَابَكَ أَحَدٌ فَقُولْ إِنِّي صَائِمْ إِنِّي صَائِمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ he said, fasting is not abandoning your food and your drink. That's not fasting. Right now, right now, no one's eating and no one's drinking. Right now. Are we fasting? Linguistically, we're fasting because fasting means to leave something. Linguistically, it means to leave something. Al-Turk, al 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 to leave something. 
مالوس إني نذرت للرحمن صما فلن أكلم اليوم إنسيا. When Jibril came and told you that I have a child with a miracle, she said, "Today, today, I have taken an oath to Ar Rahman that I'm going to fast, meaning I'm not going to talk to anybody." Zakaria in the Quran. Fasting is always connected to big things that are happening in the Quran. Zakaria fasted, Maryam fasted, connected to big issues. So the point is, she said, "I'm going to fast." She didn't talk. She didn't mean I'm not going to eat food and drink. She said, "I'm going to fast. I'm going to refrain from speaking." The Prophet said, "That's not fasting. Fasting is not from the food and the drink." He said, "Fasting, real fasting, is abandoning a level and a rough. Real fasting is abandoning." Acting foolishly, acting inappropriately, and being wooed—that's fasting. Right now, from the wisdom of Allah, you know, He always tests the believers. He gives a test to the believers. He allowed the World Cup to be on right now. Uh, back in America, when I became a Muslim in the month of Ramadan, and we grew up on basketball—not soccer, but basketball—we used to come in the month of Ramadan and going home to watch the playoffs. The basketball. It was a big trial to have a choice: would I make tarawih or would I watch the basketball game? Do I watch the World Cup or do I take advantage of tarawih, the dunya or the hereafter? Allah Azza wa is from his ikma. He made it right now. So the one who is watching the World Cup during this time, that's from a level. That's from what is a problem. But the real emphasis here is the hadith. The second part of the hadith is said: If anyone argues with you while you're fasting, then you should say to that person, "Hey, I'm fasting. I'm fasting." And that goes to show the responsibility that the person has in terms of getting his tongue together, getting his tongue together during the month of Ramadan. Because again, if he's an individual who's using foul language and he's an individual who's being abrasive and argumentative. If he's an individual who's swearing and cursing, and he's fighting. If he's an individual who's making ghibah and nemima, it's a problem. It's a problem. The control of the tongue is the biggest fitna of Bani Adam in terms of discipline. It's the big fitna from a person's good Islam. Mind your own business. That's what the Prophet says. So the Lord said, having control of the tongue is just a major issue for most people. And that's why the Prophet said, and he guaranteed. He said, "Men yat men ni, men yat men ni, aw yud men ni, ma bina lehiyehi wa ma bina rijlehi abdul lahu aljanna, abdul lahu aljanna." Anyone who can guarantee me that he's going to take control, take care of what's between his jawbones, meaning if you can guarantee me you'll take care of your tongue, you can guarantee me you'll take care of your desires. He said, "I'll guarantee you that you'll go to Jannah." So if you can guarantee Jannah, then clearly if you can take care of those two things in the month of Ramadan, he can guarantee you that you'll have a successful Ramadan. But the individual who's fasting in the month of Ramadan is not taking care of his tongue; it's a problem. So the Hadith said those rooms in Jannah are for the one who makes his speech easy, easy with his mother, with his father, with his wife, with his children, with the people around him, not swearing, not cursing. If he's one of those people who's not on that, it's a problem. And lame. Alana al kalam, alana lean. He makes the kalam or the speech easy. That's one of the recipients of the jannah. Allah used that same word, that same word in that hadith when He sent Musa and Harun to Fir'aun and He said to them, "Ibhaba ila Fir'aun fakula lahu kaul layyana la lo yitzakar u yaksha." You two go to Fir'aun and say to him a statement that is layyan. Say to him some kalam that is easy. That's for Aaron. If anyone deserves to be spoken to in a rough and tough way, it's him. So one of the amazing things that we have this time, especially with people who are giving doubt, I want to call the people to the sunnah. So I say to the brother, "Man, you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to take a sutra. You have to do this." He doesn't agree with me. So I say, "May Allah break your back. May Allah break your back. You're an innovator. You're this. You're that. This is not doubt. It's not like." The prophet he said it wasn't like that. If anything, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he used to make dua for the hidayah of people. And one time, one time, one time, he became angry 
because of what some of the non-Muslims were doing. And he was praying the Fajr prayer, and he says, Sami Allah Biman Hamida, and then he raised his hand and he started saying, Oh Allah, curse this one. Oh Allah, curse that one. And he was naming them by their names in the Salat of the Fajr. Out loud. And the companions were saying, Ani, Ani. And he was saying, Curse al Ibn Aqwa. And curse that one. And curse this one. And curse that one. After he finished the Salat, Allah Ta'ala revealed some ayahs of the Quran. Laysa lakam min al amri shaykh. And yatubu Allahu alayhum al You don't have anything to do with it, Ya Muhammad. If Allah dies him or not, if Allah forgives him or not, don't curse these people like that. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla, instead of cursing those people, Allah Azza wa Jalla guided them to Islam. The ones that the Prophet was cursing, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was a clear proof, an indication, Ikhwani, Allah is the one who guides. Everything is with Allah, not with Prophet Muhammad as a human being, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They did bad things to him, they broke his head open, they made a, gave a wound, broke his head, knocked his tooth out. He said, how can a group of people who broke their prophet's head open and knocked his tooth out, how can they ever be successful? Allah revealed the ayah. You have nothing to do with the issue, Ya Muhammad. Allah used to threaten Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah, the Khalid, used to threaten the makhluq. Allah would threaten him and tell him, if you, if you, you almost were inclined, you almost were inclined to do what they wanted you to do. But if you would have done it, we would have taken you by your right. We would have snatched you up. And there are many ayat of the Quran like that. So the Prophet wasallam, he is the Sayyid of Bani Adam. He is the best of Allah's creation. He is all of that. But he doesn't deserve to be given powers and abilities beyond what Allah Azza wa gave him. Allah made him Abdullah. Allah made him Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number three, Ikhwani, they fast consistently. This hadith, it can clearly mean the month of Ramadan where people are fasting consistently, 29 days straight, 30 days straight. It also means the person who's fasting on Mondays and Thursdays, the person who follows up Ramadan with six days of Shawwal, he's a faster. That's just his program. Allah made those rooms for him in the Jannah. So fasting 29 days, 30 days in the month of Ramadan puts him in the position. The companion Abu Abu Umama radiallahu anhu he came and he said Ya Rasulullah, dulluni ala shayin, ala amalin adkhuru bihi jannah guide me to something that if I did it I'll go into the jannah. Well, what can I do? Out of all of the things that he mentioned he could have told him establish the khilafah, make jihad, he said, he could have told him, birru waridain. He said, alayka the song, fa inna ula mafira lahu. I advise you to fast, because there's nothing like fasting. There's nothing like fasting, ya Abba Umama. You want to go to Jannah? That's an action that will get you into Jannah and get you some of those rooms. He said about that Jannah, as everyone knows, Inshallah, as we jal, Qadha sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the Jannah, Baabi yuqaru lahu rayyan, yadkhuluhu sa'imun yawmul qiyama, wa la yadkhuluhu ghayruhum, wa la yadkhulu ahadun ghayruhum, wa da dakhalu ughliqa. In the paradise, there is a door that is called the door of a rayyan. It is for those people who fast. And the hadith, the hadith, People who fast, it could be that they fast the month of Ramadan correctly. They do it correctly with the suhoor, the laying it, the iftar, the, what you're supposed to do. And clearly if they're doing more than that, then they're going to that door. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, once they go into the door, the door will be locked, no one else will be able to get in it. Now if you can just imagine for a minute, and there are many doors of a jannah, many doors, different doors of a jannah. The lady who obeys her husband, she prays five times a day, she fasts the month of Ramadan, she will be given the opportunity to enter into any of the eight doors of a Jannah that she wants to go into. So these doors are special, they're for special people. So concerning the fasters or any one of those doors, 
A person fasted the month of Ramadan only. He didn't fast other times. He just fasted Ramadan the correct way. He's entitled to enter into that door. So if you can imagine, those of us who have children, you have your baby, the day your baby is born and you're working and you come to see your baby after they cleaned your baby up and you get to the place and your baby's on the other side of the door and the door is locked and you can't get into the room to see your baby, you're going to feel a particular way. You're hungry, you go to eat something, a nice meal with water, succulent juice, salt, all that stuff. You come to the door, the door's locked, you can't get in. You're going to feel a certain type of way. Get into an argument with your child, your son, your daughter. They go into the room, they slam the door. You go behind them and open up the door, the door is locked. All of those scenarios. Prophet Muhammad is on the other side of the door. You want to get in, you can't get in. All of those scenarios, you're not going to have a good feeling. The people of Jannah, they got to be in Jannah. But that door, they can't get into the, to that door. Jannah, they don't have anger, they don't have animosity, they don't have jealousy, they don't have hasid haq, they don't have that. But the person has a tamanni, he's going to wish I could have been in that door. One of the ways to get into that door is to fast correctly in the month of Ramadan. The one who fasts Ramadan correctly will get into that door. Whereas the one who doesn't fast Ramadan correctly and he fasts the six days of Shawwal every Monday, every Thursday, Ashura, 9, 10, 11. He does all of that. He fasts a lot, a lot in Muharram. No, that one who fasted Ramadan correctly is better than the other one who didn't do the thing the right way. So fasting, Ikhwani, there is no ibadah similar to the ibadat of Islam because again, it shows the emphasis and the importance of a tawheed. And our religion is a religion of a tawheed. Kullu. Allah said all of the deeds of Adam are for himself. This is a deed of giving down. I'm giving down right now when people are watching me. Your coming to the masjid is a deed, a deed. But people are watching you. Who's here? Who's not here? When you pray, people are watching you. When you make hajj and umrah, people are doing it with you. Everything. People are watching you doing it. But the fast, Allah said, that's for me. And I'm going to reward that fast. And why is it so special? Again, the emphasis is on al-tawheed, al-ikhlas, between you and Allah. And no one else has anything to do with it. No one. The last issue, ikhwani, that was mentioned, and really I think that a special class should be given concerning this, is that the people, they pray during the night when the other people are sleeping. They pray during the night when the other people are sleeping. One of the things about this issue, very quickly, you should know, Abdullah, you should know. Qiyamul Layl, Qiyamul Layl, Qiyamul Layl, it begins right after Salat al-Isha. So any prayer that you make after Salat al-Isha is Qiyamul Layl. And that's because the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in many hadith, let the Salat al Witr, which is from the nighttime, let it be the last prayer that you pray. And you say, pray it after Isha. So, Qiyam al Layl, Salat al Layl, it begins right after Salat al Isha. During these days, right now, during these days where we have this problem with the horizon and the sun and all that kind of stuff, then clearly, clearly, after Salat al Isha, it's Qiyam al Layl. He prayed Salat al-Maghrib with his companions and after that he got up and went into his house and they said, let's stay here and wait until Isha. He came back out. He said, have you people been here since Maghrib? Because he saw so many people and they didn't move. Have you been here since Maghrib? He said, yeah. They say yes. He said, I sent to you. did good. Again, if the Prophet had the ilm al-ghayb, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he was Hazar Nazir, he wouldn't have said, have you people been here? Hazar Nazir. His house is right there, connected to the masjid. He goes into that house, the people are sitting, he doesn't know, and they're next to his house. He doesn't know. He comes back out. Have you been here? And look how close he is, and you're telling us he's Hazen Nazen, and you're insisting Hazen Nazen, the Lord Hazen Nazen. And if you don't believe that, something's wrong with you. No, if you believe that, Aki, if you believe that, Wallahi, you're going to make yourself in a position that you don't want to be in. You're going to make yourself in a position where you won't get shafa. You won't get it because you're bringing something to the table that the Prophet spent 23 years trying to destroy. Trying to destroy shirk and kufr and innovation and ghulu and going overboard. He was against that. 
Those people said, Yeah, our master, the son of our master, yo, come out, Ya Muhammad, raising him up, bigging him up. He said, hey, hey, don't say that to me. I'm Abdullah, Rasulullah. Just say Abdullah. Don't, don't, don't say all of that. Cut that out. Just call me Abdullah. I'm Abdullah Rasulullah. Don't, don't, don't give me all of that. The man came when he met Rasulullah for the first time. He was shaking. You can see his throat shaking in front of the Nabi. Salawat from the Prophet said, Hey, hey, I'm not a king. I'm just a man from the desert, from Mecca, whose mother used to eat simple food. Relax, relax, sit down, calm down. He didn't make people feel in awe of him. The companions felt the awe that we feel if a big scholar came through the door. The awe that you feel when an elder person from your family, your uncle, someone comes to the door. You have, they had that respect, but that thing that the people have today, Haza Naza didn't die, doesn't have a shadow. He knows everything. Hey, what are you talking about? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companions, Bula anni akhsha in yushuq alik laja'altu salat al-isha fi muntasif al-layl. He said, if it wasn't for the fact that I thought it would be difficult for you people, I would have made salat al-isha at the middle of the night time. He said, but it would be too difficult. The middle of the night is you take salat al-isha when it comes in, salat al-fajr when it comes in, you put that, you take those hours, that's the middle of the night. So now Isha comes in in Birmingham about uh, 11 o'clock. Fajr comes in 3 o'clock, something like that. 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. So the middle of that is Muntasafilay. The Prophet said, if I wasn't afraid, it would be difficult for you. So he didn't want to make people pray at 2 o'clock at night. The point is, the point is, he praised those companions because they were sitting there at a time when... Salat was difficult. They stayed in the masjid. Any time you are doing something that a lot of people are not doing, Allah loves that thing. Take that as a principle, Ya Abdullah. You want to look for the deeds to do? Anytime people are doing, there's a time or place where people are not doing something and it's correct to do that thing, it's from Islam, from the Sunnah, try to do it because Allah loves it. If you're praying late at night when people are sleeping, Allah loves it because you're one of the few people who are doing that. Allah comes down at the last third of the night. He'll give anyone who's up at that time, make a salat, make a toba, istighfar, he'll give them what it. Why? Because it's a time when most people are not doing something. He said that the people who are the ghuraba, the ghuraba, they're going to go to Jannah. Who are the ghuraba? They're the people who he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they're the minority. They're the few people who are trying to make things correct when most of the people mess them up. So someone wants to be a, like in the communities. He's trying to help. There's a problem. He's trying to help the situation. He's from the few. So if there's some project, something that's going on, and only a few people are doing it, only a few people are serving the people the food, be of those people. Allah loves it. When you're doing something that's like Sha'ban, Osama said, Ya Rasulullah, why do you fast Sha'ban more than any other month outside of Ramadan? He said, because Sha'ban is a month that many people don't know the importance of it. So I fasted this month. And he spoke the truth. He fasted most of Sha'ban. Some hadith in Bukhari Muslim said he fasted all of Sha'ban. Because it's a month not many people know about. If you go to the marketplace in Khwani, here downtown, city center, there is a dua, any marketplace. Simple, easy dua. He said, anyone who goes to the bazaar, to the souk, if he says the simple, easy dua, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahu, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hal, yuhyi wa yumit, wa huwa hayyum la yamut, bi yadih al-khayr, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Anyone who says that simple dua, Allah will go to give him one million hasana, Allah will take off of him one million sins, Allah will give him one million darajat, and Allah will build them a house in general. Why all of that stuff for such a simple, easy dua that can be said in less than 15 seconds? La ilaha illallah wahtahu la sharika lahu lahu al-mukhu lahu al-ham yuhdi wa yumitu hayu la yumut bi yadih al-khaybu ala kulli shayin qadir Before going into the marketplace, why does he get all that? One million hasana, one million sayyidi are taken off, 
one million daraja in Jannah and a house in Jannah. Well, why just for that? That's because in the marketplace, most of the people going into the marketplace, they're not remembering Allah. Most of the people in the marketplace are doing the wrong thing. Most of the people in the marketplace are compromising their religion and so forth and so on. So the general rule, the general rule is, if a lot of people are not doing that thing, then try to engage yourself in that thing. And from them is Salat at the night time. And from that Salat, Taraweeh. At Taraweeh. At Taraweeh, Ikhwani, the Hadith said, those houses in Jannah for the people who pray when the people are sleeping. This Ramadan is going to be tough. Allah After praying Salat and Isha, Taraweeh, you go home, no time to sleep, you have to wake up for suhoor, and you have to go to work or whatever. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. That's how it is. But I would encourage you in terms of an incentive. Just remember, there are rooms in Jannah for the people who pray Taraweeh. For the people who pray after the night time. Not to mention other stuff. Those of you, those of us who were not praying, we didn't pray. 17, 18, 20, some times of our lives, we were not praying. Three years, five years, we were not praying. Prophet say, you know, Qiyam Allah will say to the Manatic, and he already knows. Look at the Salat of my slave. Did he complete them or not? If he completed them, it will be written for him complete. If he didn't complete them, Allah will say to the Malaika, see about the Salat of my slaves from the Tatoa, from the other prayers. To Rakas, to the Masjid, to Rawi, Wudu, whatever. Allah will say, take the prayers, those other prayers, and complete what he was deficient in. And all of the deeds will be like that. For the fast that he didn't do, when he missed it, after the Salat is done, the Salat is like, the Siyam is like that. Look at the Ramadan of my slave. Is it complete or not? If it's complete, bring down completely. Not complete, Allah said, look at the other fast that he did. <coughs> he caused so many people to break their fast. He himself, he fast days of Hajj and so forth and so on. So those of us who did not pray at one time, stay in the Taraweeh because the Taraweeh has two <coughs> many benefits connected to it. But we've spoken more than an hour, so we're going to put the uh, lid on this uh, Reminder, asking Allah Azza wa Jalla to allow us to get the most out of Ramadan and not to allow Ramadan and go without us being of those people who have been forgiven. And Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum is A'la and A'la. Okay, so if you guys have any questions, inshallah, um, you can put your question forward for the next few minutes until my man Bashar says we have to stop. Bashar, are you the boss here? Who's the boss here? Do you brothers have any questions concerning what we mentioned or maybe general questions about Ramadan even? Salam uh, What's your name? Abbas. Abbas. I always forget Abbas. Although I know you. Fuck the guy. Them conditions that you mentioned, do you have to fulfill all of them conditions to get the rooms all safe? Just um, good question, Ahi Abbas. The hadith of Rasulullah mentioned Allah prepared the rooms for the people who do these four things. So, do you have to do all four of them? Or if you do one of them, then that's sufficient, two or three. Do you have to fulfill all of them? There are those people from the scholars who said you have to do all of them. <clears throat> because that's what he said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But when you look at each and every one of them, there are too many other proofs and ayat that come in the Quran and the Sunnah that show if you do that thing by itself, you'll get the reward of a jannah. Like those ayats we mentioned about feeding, like those ayats that we mentioned about fasting, like those ayats that we mentioned about uh, those people who uh, control their tongues and so forth and so forth. Good question, Aki Abbas. Any more questions? Ikhwani? Uh, brother, um, is any different darja of um, reward for a fast? For example, if it's a hard fast, you had a lot of trouble during the day. And, uh, Good question, Akhi. What's your name? Zaid. Zaid. Uh, concerning the question of Brother Zaid, are there different daraja, different in terms of the thawab <laughs> and the ajur? Is it all the same or 
is it different? No doubt, there's a principle in Islam that comes to us from the authentic Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, qadr al nasab." Verily, a person's reward will be determined by the difficulty that he goes through. So the individual who lives right across the street from the masjid and he walks <coughs> ten steps does not get the reward of the individual who's walking uh, 100 steps or 200 steps and so forth and so on. The individual who is going to um, fast in Africa, for an example, where it's extremely hot and they don't have the ease that we have in this country, it definitely is going to be more difficult. The individual who's fasting longer hours, it's going to be different from those who's fasting shorter hours. The people who are fasting right now with what's going on, the summertime, he has to work, he has to fudge with Isha and all of that jihad that we're going to have to do, then obviously it's going to be more reward. Provided the individual doesn't make it difficult for himself. So Allah is someone makes the religion difficult on himself. He wants to fast consecutive days without breaking his fast. No, you don't get the reward because you're making things difficult on yourself. The individual he wants to pray all night long. He doesn't want to get married. He wants to be too tough. The one who makes it unnecessarily difficult upon himself, then he's not rewarded because he's been pro prohibited from doing that. Allah doesn't burden you beyond your ability. Do what you can do. Allah Don't kill yourselves. Allah was forever gentle to you. Abdullah ibn Abbaq, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu used to read the Quran in one night and Qiyamul Layl and used to fast every single day. Now I can't imagine it. That whole Quran in one day and fast every day. When the Prophet heard about that, he said, what's this I hear about you? Reading the Quran every day and fasting every night and forsaking your women. If he was Hazir Nazir, if he was Ibn al he wouldn't have said that. He said, are you doing that? He said, yes, you know, so I said, don't do that. He said, read the Quran once in a month. He said, I can do more. He said, then read it in 20 days. I can do more. Then read it in 12 days. He said, I can do it more. Do it in 10. Do it more. Do it in 7. Do it in 5. And don't do it in less than that. And about your fasting. He said, just fast three days. I, I can do more. All the way till you made him do the fast of Dawood. One day on, one day off. And he did that. One day on, one day off. One day on, one day off. One day on, one day off. It's the best fast. But when he became old, he was infirm. He couldn't see. He was weak. And he told the students from the Tabi'in, Oh, I wish I would have taken the advice of Rasulullah Sallallahu because that be bad. Look what he did to me. It destroyed me now. So the more difficulty that a person uh, is going through, the more reward. Asa and takru shay'am wa huwa khayrun lakum. And maybe you hate something and it's better for you like these long hours. So you revert brothers, be patient, be patient, be patient. Any more questions, Akhwan? Ahli Abu Safiya. Regarding children, the difficult is in Ramadan, especially the long hours and everything. At what point do you start encouraging them to engage them? Well, the kids, you said. Certainly encouraging our kids to fast. The scholars of Islam, Akhwani, they say that fasting is obligatory upon the person who's a Muslim. So the one who's a non-Muslim like our people are doing interfaith dialogue. Two extremes. One extreme in this country are the people want to blow everything up and kill everybody. They want to blow everything up, they want to kill everybody. Rough and tough. The other extreme are those Muslims who are apologetic. In Birmingham, they said the schools in Birmingham, we have extremists in our schools. Do they mean extremists who are blowing things up? No. They mean extremists because they say, boys sit over here, girls sit over here. You're extreme. Because in art, in art, the Muslim teacher said, oh, I don't want you people to draw the private parts of this stuff and don't draw images. You're extreme. You taught the kid when he goes to the bathroom to make it sting with water. You're extreme. So here comes the Muslim with the BBC and they say, hey, you're a parent. What do you think? And the parent says, yeah, yeah, I don't know why they're so extreme like that. Why don't they just put it in? Well, there's British values and mix everybody up. 
I hate them be the extreme like that either. Don't apologize about the religion. So we can't invite non-Muslims come with us and fast with us. Come with us and make salat with us. Because only the Muslim is the one who fasts. The one who is aqil, not crazy. And the one who is balik, he's old enough. Balik, the scholars say balik. What is balik? Mature. For the boy, three things have to be there. For the girl, four things. And this is the point. Three things have to be there. Four for the girl. They say balik, 15 years old. That's when the kid should be fasting. He has to fast. That's balul. Or, or, if the boy or the girl has hair growing, that's balul. Number three, the boy can have a dream from his desires. The girl can have a dream from her desires. And then the fourth thing with the girl is her period, barakallah, fiqul. But despite that, 15, 15, the scholar said, if he doesn't get hair and all that stuff, but some of the scholars, most of them say, but just like Salah, you should put pressure on them to fast when they attend because the companions, radiallahu anhum, they used to encourage their children to fast and they would be in the masjid waiting for and maghrib and the kids would start getting up tight, making noise and the companions said, we used to give them toys to play with to calm them down. Instead of breaking the fast, we would give them toys to play with in order to calm them down. Anyway, I'm mad at Gordon's book and Muwatta, there's some of them.